to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire, broadcasting to you from Southern California, and you are listening all over the United States, the European Union, Great Britain, the Middle East, South America, <clears throat> and so on and so forth, all over the place. We get emails, uh, Facebooks, all kinds of correspondence that lets us know that people are listening and watching the uh, daily Paul McGuire report, and they're watching the video uh, Prophetic Emergency Alerts with Paul McGuire. You may have noticed, especially those of you in Scandinavia, we've gotten a lot of interest from people in Scandinavia lately, and Australia, and New Zealand, and Canada, looking for answers And they tune into the program, Paul McGuire Report, because they're looking for answers from a biblical worldview, but not just any biblical worldview. They're looking for answers from a biblical worldview that they trust, that has credibility and integrity in terms of interpreting the inspired and inerrant Word of God, the Bible and integrity in the commentary uh, of of the host, which is me. And integrity there, I mean, not only integrity in my personal life, because, you know, the Bible has something to say about Christian leaders. And Christian leaders, whether they're pastors or evangelists or in any kind of platform, before the public, any kind of authority before the public, that would constitute a Christian leader. And the Bible defines what is required in a Christian leader. You know, things like that the Christian leader has a good reputation in the community <clears throat> that he lives in, that, that a good Christian leader is, is the faithful husband of one wife, and that the Christian leader has integrity both in his personal life, his family life, but also integrity in rightly dividing the Word of God. Now, if we were to take that principle, it's not really a principle, it's a law, and apply it to use it as a grid not because we want to go on some legalistic, judgmental trip. Not because we want to go on some kind of witch hunt. <clears throat> but because we want to uh, know who's credible, who's not credible. And the way you determine that is you look at a person's life. <clears throat> you look at their track record. You look at their biography. You look at their history. Did they just appear out of nowhere in the last couple of years? You know, it's amusing to me that these people would get on TV and say, oh, their ministry's been around for a long time, like three or four years. What are you kidding me? Three or four years? That's like like nothing. This is not for the purpose of boasting. This is for the purpose of telling the truth about this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church. This ministry has been operating for at least 40 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. And that means there's a whole lot of people who know who Paul McGuire is all across the United States and the world. There's a whole lot of Christian leaders, major Christian leaders, Big name Christian leaders. Again, this is not for the purposes of bragging. This is for the purpose of establishing integrity, a record of integrity. Christian leaders, very well known Christian leaders that I've worked with in ministry personally, who know me, they come from a variety of of Christian biblical uh, doctrines and a variety of different denominational perspectives, because I, I you know, don't just uh, mix with people who, who match my checklist exactly. And so notable Christian leaders endorse me personally and endorse this ministry. 
And it goes back decades. It goes back 40 years. Actually, it goes longer than that. <clears throat> and you can see a track record of where I've been, what I've done, <clears throat> and my overall reputation. Now, I want to be very careful not to, to uh, come off like I'm bragging, because that is very dangerous to me and to you. Simply establishing biographical detail, details, which are important. So when you listen to somebody, whether it's on alternative media or social media or TV or radio or whatever, whatever it is, it's important that you know something about the integrity of the individual that you're allowing to teach you or instruct you, okay? It's important that you know that, and it's important that you know something about uh, key, key attributes of their life. Like, for example, have they been the faithful husband of one wife? Well, have they not? I'm not trying to be legalistic. We live in an age where there's an attack on the family, and tragically, divorce has been epidemic. So, I believe that God does not want divorce, obviously. But sometimes people sin, okay? That's just a reality. I'm not excusing or justifying sin. <clears throat> but if they, after they sin, they go through a proper restoration, a proper biblical reconciliation with mature biblical spiritual elders, and it's proven that they've been restored, and that may mean that... Uh, they are now married to somebody else, and I won't get into the complications of why that may be. But a person, what I'm trying to say is that even if a person fails in that area, it doesn't automatically disqualify them from uh, ministry, assuming assuming that they went through a proper biblical pastoral reconciliation. And restoration. Now I learned that I've only been married once to one wife, faithfully by God's grace. And you know why I say by God's grace? Because we live in a sinful world. I'm no better. You're no better than any other sinful man or woman. I remember uh, <clears throat> when I was. Uh, on Fox News Network, like, constantly for 10 years <clears throat> before they changed their, their programming content. I was uh, a, but still am, but I was a nationally syndicated radio talk show host of the Paul McGuire Show, okay? So Fox would have me on constantly. They'd send a limousine to my house or a limousine to the radio studio I was on, and I would get last-minute phone calls. And you would take these phone calls because there were a hundred guys, a hundred media guys, who would jump on it. And if you didn't take it, there were plenty. The people were standing in line to get the opportunity. So I remember Neil Cavuto's producer, a wonderful woman. She was really nice because uh, well, she was just she was just very helpful. And I remember her inviting me on behalf of Neil Cavuto be on his show, <clears throat> and this was kind of like a special show because they were shooting the show at the big Pebble Beach, California uh, golf tournament. And for those of you who know uh, California, you know where it is, and those of you that are golfing fans, you know where that is. So the big Pebble Beach, California golfing tournament. And... Uh, <clears throat> Neil Cavuto was going to be there, and as usual, I was there for like, I don't know, two or three hours, and he had a, a big lineup of guests. Now, <clears throat> to make that appearance, this was my normal lifestyle for years, and I, I don't recommend it to anybody because it's really stupid. It was stupid of me. I burned myself out, really. Because I deluded myself into thinking I was Superman. I was jumping on planes here and there. I was flying. I was doing what Trump was doing in terms of flying all over the country and speaking. 
But unlike Trump, I wasn't flying in a, all by my, well, I wasn't flying in a magnificent jumbo jet that I own or, you know, Air Force One, which has its own bedroom and stuff. At least he could take a cat nap. I was traveling. I don't even travel first class. <clears throat> For the most, and I'm not judging people who do travel first class. When people invite me to speak, uh, I almost, well, it's about 100% of the time I do not take first class. I sit in the regular seats with everybody else. And that's very hard for a speaker and a minister because chances are you didn't sleep the night before. You're not going to sleep the day before. And it would be really nice to get some sleep, some quiet time. But I perceive myself first and foremost as a servant in Jesus Christ and not someone to be served. And I'm serious about that. Thank God my life was shaped by true men of God, like one of my spiritual fathers, Dr. Jack Hayford. And when you're around Dr. Jack Hayford, uh, it's iron sharpens iron. He, he's you, Just hanging out in his presence and listening to him sanctifies you, because he's a no-baloney preacher, okay? <clears throat> and he walks his talk privately. He has incredible integrity. So. I would always fly in, you know, same seats that everybody else flew in, which is ex- exhausting. But I'm not complaining. That's that's what God told me to do. Because a lot of times people are making a real sacrifice to fly you in to speak somewhere at a conference or whatever. And you know, I'm not royalty. Once again, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm not coming to be served. And if that's my attitude. I ought to do everybody a big favor and stay home. If my attitude is to be served and not to come to serve, <clears throat> that I might as well stay home because I'm, I'm not going to have any anointing anyway. Anointing and power comes on the man or the woman who endeavors by faith in Christ to be a servant in Jesus Christ. That's when the anointing and the power flows. My new book, which I'm very excited about, I've been working like 12 hours a day or more on it, and it's hard work, but it will be powerful, because it's talking about a a, a definition of what I believe God wants. I believe God wants an authentic and biblical uh, third great awakening in America. Now, let me say, definition is everything here. God does not want a counterfeit revival in America. We don't need that. God does not want a Kundalini spirit, uh, uh, a cult spirit, uh, a a great deception, uh, a great apostasy, third awakening. God does not want that. God wants an authentic, biblical, third great awakening. If it's not, it's not guaranteed. If God's people will repent of their sins and seek His face, and continue on at it, but in order for that authentic and biblical revival to rip through America, like the first Great Awakening, which was an authentic and biblical revival, ripped through America, rocked the thirteen colonies. You know why God could trust the pilgrims and Puritans to steward that biblical revival and biblical first great awakening? You know why it happened? You know why God's power was released in an unprecedented manner? It's because he could trust the pilgrims and Puritans to be faithful, to be faithful when God sent his power from on high down from heaven. He could trust his pastoral ministry, evangelistic ser- uh, servants, to be faithful, to rightly divide the Word of God. And that's why it, it transformed America and created a spiritual foundation in America that we are still benefiting from. But you see, the Pilgrims and Puritans, they were different in many ways from modern evangelicals or Protestant born-again Christians. They were different in this way. 
they understood that in order to have an authentic and biblical first great awakening, you a first great awakening, it implies a spiritual awakening. It implies that God's people must be awakened by repentance, by conviction of the Holy Spirit, and by a move of the Holy Spirit, not a counterfeit spirit, on his people. His people must be awakened to their sins, to their depravity, to the fact that they're going to go to hell unless they repent of their sins and trust Christ as their Savior. That's an awakening. Now, the first part of an authentic biblical uh, great awakening is the spiritual part. There must be a unique outpouring of the Holy Spirit, dunamis, dynamite, power from on high, upon the church and the communities. So the first part of it is the power of the Holy Spirit descending upon a nation and communities and states or whatever. But the second part, and this is where evangelicals are sound asleep, thus they need to be awakened, thus we use the term Great Awakening. This is where evangelicals are asleep, whereas the Pilgrims and Puritans were awakened. The Pilgrims and Puritans understood that a true, authentic, biblical Great Awakening had two primary components. Two. First, the Holy Spirit, the spiritual part of an authentic biblical Great Awakening. And secondly, the intellectual part, the knowledge part, the the uh, uh, logical part. Okay, it goes hand in hand. Now, by that I mean an authentic biblical great awakening must have the power of the Holy Spirit, not a counterfeit spirit. And secondly, the second part. That, that Christians today are AWOL, absent without leave, and are asleep on, is the second part of a biblical third great awakening must flow from a truly authentic biblical worldview, which simply means all of our theology, all of our Bible study, all of our doctrine is biblically based. We're rightly dividing the Word of God. And then when we attempt to penetrate society with the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are equipped both spiritually and intellectually and with knowledge, both biblical and practical and historical and medical and philosophical and technological. We are equipped in the arena of a biblical worldview to deal with the major power centers of our society. This is critical that we have a two, it's two uh, areas of emphasis. Now, because the evangelical church uh, has rejected God's command to us to have a authentic biblical great awakening uh, that comes from a biblical worldview, because of that sin, we have become powerless. We can't defend rationally, logically, and intellectually our, our beliefs, and it, it gives us an Achilles heel of battle. So the purpose of this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church, and I've been seeking the Lord a long time about this, and I've been seeking the Lord intensively over the last week or so, especially on the 4th of July. Why? Because now every 4th of July, I go through a prayer of repentance, uh, personal repentance, and then as an intercessor, an intercessory prayer warrior, I come before the Lord, Lord through the blood of Jesus Christ, and I repent for the sins of the church and for America. And as an intercessor, I appropriate the blood of Jesus Christ on my sins and the sins of the church. And then I worship God, and I go into spiritual warfare, and I call on God to move. Okay? Now, we're going to be back in just a second. 
because I believe the Lord has put an explosive truth in my heart that I want to share. And by explosive, I'm talking about the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, which means dynamite, the dynamite explosion of the power of the Holy Spirit, being clothed with power from on high. This is the title of my new book. You can pre-order it now. And if you pre-order it now, you get a financial discount. So you need to pre-order it now. We also have all the other books that you can get at a, a bulk order discount and save money now. All you got to do is go to ballmcguire.us. That's ballmcguire.us. Be sure to pre-order yourself a copy of Power from an Eye by Paul McGuire and get a discount on it. I promise you this book will change your life like no other book. And it is my sincere prayer that God would use this book, Power from on High, to ignite an authentic biblical uh, revival, an authentic biblical third great awakening in America and the world. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. We'll be back in just a moment. Wherever you are on planet Earth, whether you're in the good old USA where we had the 4th of July or Great Britain, the European Union, the Ukraine, Russia, wherever you are listening in, whatever time zone you're listening in, spread these truths far and wide. By the way, our, I've been warning you about this for a long time, and I've, I've asked you uh, uh, many times to make sure you know our alternative and backup uh, media platforms in the event that we mysteriously get taken down or censored without warning, which happened about I don't know, two weeks ago, uh, <clears throat> YouTube uh, took us down without warning. And uh, just so you know, when you're taken down, and a lot of people you listen to have been taken down, you get one chance after you're taken down. And the next time, you are removed from reality permanently. Pretty heavy. Pretty heavy. So, um, you know, I try to be, I mean, I, I'm, I have made a serious effort start, starting two years ago or more to make sure that our content would be both truthful, but deliberately create content that would uh, uh, not get us kicked off uh, YouTube and, and other social media platforms. So anyway, they never gave us, and they never really do, they didn't give us a clear, precise reason of what we did, uh, which they consider wrong. And by the way, the the episode of the Paul McGuire Report that they shut down our entire YouTube channel over was an episode that they had already played and approved. And I listened to the episode, and quite frankly, I didn't hear anything that I that I believe violated what they call their community guidelines. Now there may have been, been a couple of sentences in or there, uh, in there that <clears throat> reflected uh, a biblical viewpoint or reflected a Christian viewpoint. But if I'm going to be censored for having a biblical or Christian viewpoint, well then the situation is more dire than we realize. Anyway, uh, by God's grace, I am thankful to YouTube for uh, two weeks later restoring our YouTube channel. But what you have to understand is for every Christian broadcaster or Christian social media person or minister or whatever, anyone who's speaking the truth, and I go out of my way not to be inflammatory. I don't uh, release hate speech. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's not that I, I avoid uh, uh, 
topics and content that are unnecessarily um, would cause censorship. So we were shut down, and that means nobody can receive our new videos. And if we're shut down again, what they do uh, is they will seize all of your videos from the first one you have ever produced. And they will take it off the air because they own it. You don't. And I'm not going to name names, but a lot of the people you listen to or watch have had that happen to them. So I don't want to belabor the thing, but there I was on the 4th of July, <clears throat> which was yesterday, and I was thinking about this. And uh, I decided to contact YouTube a second time and uh, ask them if, politely if they would restore my channel. And what was going on in the back of my mind was, you know, the 4th of July is a time when Americans of all persuasions, all ethnic groups, categories of people, 4th of July is a time when we come together as a diverse nation and celebrate our freedoms that are unique in America, such as the constitutional freedoms of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and all the other freedoms. And then uh, in, in the Declaration of Independence, we're celebrating the fact that our, our founding fathers, the Pilgrims and Puritans, uh, understood this powerful truth that, that it is the Creator, capital C, that has given us certain inalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we could talk about all kinds of freedoms we have in America, but the only reason we have these incredible freedoms and opportunities in America is because of the biblical worldview that the Pilgrims and Puritans had. Not just their Holy Spirit experience, but the biblical worldview that the Pilgrims and Puritans had. And the Pilgrims and Puritans made sure that when our first Constitution Bill of Rights was solidified, that it was based on a strong biblical worldview. Because only out of a biblical worldview does America have these totally unique freedoms, such as God has given us, no, excuse me, the Creator has given us certain inalienable rights. That means our founding documents created by the Pilgrims and Puritans recognize that it is the Creator God, not man, not any government, that gives us certain inalienable rights. That means every man and woman in America has given, been given rights by the Creator that are inalienable, which means since we have been given our rights ultimately by the Creator, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, no man, no man-made government, no politician, no, no man-made court, no man-made law can steal from the people what God has given them as a God-given right from birth. That's intense. And with that goes the God-given rights of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and other freedoms. Freedom from unreasonable search and seizure, which, by the way, if anybody think, it means, obviously, freedom from excessive electronic surveillance. So, the reason America still has those freedoms to whatever degree they're still left is because of this. And let's just repeat it again. I'm, I'm talking all about it in my new book, Power from on High. And it's in the book, uh, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. These freedoms have been embedded in America because the pilgrims and Puritans had a robust, intellectual, intelligent, biblical worldview. They understood, the Pilgrims and Puritans understood history. 
They understood the entire Bible. They understood government. They understood law. They understood medicine. They understood philosophy. They understood religious freedom and encroachment on religious freedom. And they developed the finest schools in America, bar none. The, the most exceptional educational establishments in America were the schools run by the Pilgrims of Puritans. All the Ivy League schools that are now preaching Marxism originally started out as Pilgrim Puritan schools to equip ministers and evangelists to reach the world for Christ. So back then in the 1600s and 1700s, the Pilgrim and Puritan schools were so academically excellent, on top of being theologically excellent. I mean, you went to a Pilgrim and Puritan school, you learned uh, a whole wide scope of academic excellence, but you also learned in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin the entire truths of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So when our founding fathers, who weren't even Christians, they were influenced because they went to Pilgrim and Puritan schools, and so the Pilgrims and Puritans, unlike modern evangelicals today, had a they, they understand understood the two parts of an authentic and biblical uh, first great awakening: the power of the Holy Spirit, not a counterfeit spirit or deception, and number two, an authentic biblical revival requires a solid biblical understanding of a biblical worldview and how to apply to a biblical worldview to every area of life. That enabled God to trust the pilgrims and Puritans to create the firm foundation of knowledge and wisdom, historical understanding and biblical truths upon which we could securely build the foundation of America, a foundation that no other nation in history has ever uh, built, okay? There's no other nation in the history of mankind that has the equivalent of an American dream. There is no other nation in the history of the world where people from all religions, all nations, are continuing to flock to America to take part in the American dream. This has never happened before. There is no other nation in the history of mankind which has ever had a massive, prosperous, wealthy, and free working class and middle class. Only America. Only America. And you can say all you want, but you can, you know, people are brainwashed through scientific mind control. I explained that in The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind. Of the world, also a prophecy of the future of America, Volume One and Two, and also conquering the Matrix. Communism, Marxism, socialism proceeds by brainwashing. They don't have any freedoms. They live in police states and dictatorships and totalitarian states. America still has freedom. So, what is the challenge before us? is that the Church of Jesus Christ in America, along with every true Christian in America and every other area of the world, we must all come to the place now, Christian maturity, where we understand the sobriety of the of times, that indeed we are in the signs of the times, that indeed we are in the last days that Jesus Christ spoke of, and the supernatural church of Jesus Christ, which is to be filled with power from on high, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, is also to have a biblical worldview. Okay? And it's upon those two foundations God desires to use the church in America, despite its sins and faults. It is the desire of God right now. Can you please listen very carefully to what I'm saying? I'm not asking you to listen very carefully to what I'm saying because I have a messianic complex or I think I'm something special or I call myself a prophet. If you know me, 
know that I don't indulge in any of those things. Number one is I don't call myself a prophet. Number two is I don't think I'm some kind of messiah. I don't have a messianic complex. But I am simply a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been seeking the Lord and reading his word. And I believe with all my heart that the Lord desires from the beginning of time. God knew you. God knew me. And every Christian listening and every Christian around the world, it's a biblical fact that God knew each one of us before the foundation of the world, and he created us to be here for such a specific time as this to complete a specific mission and assignment in the last days. In other words, because you embrace a biblical worldview, because you rightly divide the Word of God, you are not insecure, as some Christians are, regarding the reliability and the scientific reliability of your faith. You and I both know that the Bible is spiritually true and scientifically true. We know that because we've done our homework. We know that the theory of evolution is a complete farce. It's completely not true. If the theory of evolution were true, then all of us are here by random chance accident, and none of us has a mission in life or a purpose in life. That's what they indoctrinate and brainwash millions of students in the school systems to believe that nonsense. You and I were called by God before the time, before the foundation of the world. God knew your name. God knew my name before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, God knew us before our father's seed and our mother's egg united. God had already downloaded into us the spiritual gifts and natural gifts that we would need to accomplish our mission and destiny. So every one of us has a mission and destiny to accomplish in the last days. Now, as we come together as the supernatural body of Christ, I, I would like you to hear me, but I would like you to use your discernment and the Word of God and I would like you to hear the Spirit of God speaking through me. Not that I claim to be a prophet or something special, but whenever someone's speaking truth, that's biblical truth, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is on those words. And I would say to you that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is on my words right now. And I'm saying to you, with all my heart, I believe that God Almighty, the biblical God, Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of Lord of lords, has a special destiny and plan and mission for you and America and Christians in other nations around the world, that he has a special last day's destiny and mission and plan for you, wherever you are, but especially in America. What the pilgrims and Puritans built into America has been under attack viciously for 150 years, but it still remains intact enough. Okay, we still have the legality, we still have the economy, we still have the opportunity to fulfill the mission God has given us. And that mission is this. Jesus Christ wants to use America because America has been uniquely privileged and blessed. God wants to use America in the last days to go throughout the world and bring in a massive, massive last days soul harvest. Jesus said that the fields are white for harvest, but the laborers are few. If we look around the earth in America, there are people everywhere that are ready to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
They just need somebody to preach the gospel to them in an understandable, intelligent, and effective way. And when somebody does that, they are going to repent, and they're going to be born again by faith, and Jesus Christ is going to welcome them into the kingdom of God. It is the desire of God in the last days that millions, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people, in fact, will accept Christ by faith, will be born again, and will be part of this massive last day's soul harvest that God wants to bring in at the end of the age. And I mean that with all my heart. You, it's not an accident that you're listening to me, Paul McGuire, wherever you're listening to me in the United States or around the world. It's not an accident. God has networked us together through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are only going to be able to fulfill this mission, this divine destiny, to the degree that we're obedient, to the degree that we believe God, and to the degree that we truly unify in the Word of God and the, the true faith of Christianity. We must unify, okay? Not false unity, but true biblical unity. Time is at hand for us to do that, because we don't know how much longer we'll have. There are serious conditions in this world. The reality is there exists, I'm writing again about this in great detail in my book, which you pre-order, uh, Power from on High, there exists what is called a globalist elite that, that controls uh, the world and America and, and media and Internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They, many of them, are Luciferians. They're involved in the cult. They do not want a last day's soul harvest. They're trying to stop it. But God wants a last day's soul harvest because before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is sooner than you think, before Jesus Christ returns, let's take this seriously. You, you, you like me, should be filled with with. Not nuttiness, not craziness, but we talk about the soon return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Uh, you and I should have genuine excitement and expectation. Uh, this is something that the human race has been waiting for for thousands of years. But before God comes, because you see, when God comes, and, and I don't want to get into the debate. It's legitimate, and I'm not afraid of it. I've taught eschatology as a professor of, the, of King's College and Seminary for like 20 years. That's a professor of eschatology teaches Bible prophecy. So I, I taught all viewpoints regarding the rapture. Okay, so I'm not here to push one viewpoint on the rapture. Uh, there are plenty of other Bible teachers and ministries that specialize in that, and trying to grab hold of the essential truth, which is whether you believe Jesus Christ comes in a rapture and then the second coming, or you, you have a particular view as to when the rapture will be, uh, that's, you know, fine. But we would all agree that Jesus is returning soon. Now, when Jesus returns at the second coming, he's going to descend upon planet Earth. Uh, he's going to be followed with the armies of heaven. He's going to defeat the devil, the Antichrist, the false prophet, all those who have received the mark of the beast. And he's going to wage war against them uh, at Armageddon. And uh, he is going to be victorious, and he's going to rule and reign planet Earth for a literal thousand-year millennial period, where he will completely restore the Earth environmentally, spiritually, ecologically, in all those ways. He will be a co-ruler of planet Earth from Jerusalem with King David. Now, when Jesus comes down in Armageddon, 
He's going to defeat the dragon. Mystery Babylon, the world system, is going to fall. And God and God's angels and God's people, the armies of heaven, are going to defeat Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist, and all those who receive the mark of the beast when he comes at Armageddon. And it will be a bloodbath. It will be the wrath of God being poured out upon this earth. But prior to that, prior to that, because God is love, God's going to come prior to that to rescue, to deliver as many people as he possibly can. God wants to bring, because God is love, that's his primary characteristic, it is the desire of God to bring as many people as possible. That means billions of more people God wants to bring into him, into, uh, into heaven with him. Okay? That's the desire of God, because God is love. Okay? This is very important. So our job is to facilitate the greatest evangelistic thrust, the greatest last day soul harvest in the history of the world, and to ignite, because you can't have a, a great last day soul harvest and everything else unless you ignite an authentic, biblical, uh, third great awakening. And our job is to ignite that in the power of the Spirit, and that to ignite that with the Word of God by developing a biblical worldview. So, you and I have a mission. Church in America has an unusual mission because we've been given so much. We may think a lot has been taken away, But let me share something with you. Yes, a lot has been taken away. For Christians in America and around the world, our freedoms have been under attack. Christianity has been under attack. There are Christian martyrs who are being killed, imprisoned, raped, and tortured all around the world, especially communist China and the communist nations. But even in the middle of all that, God has allowed there to be a Uh, open door by which we can bring in the last day's soul harvest and bring in hundreds of millions of people. That's our mission. That is what God has called us to do. So I'm asking you to allow the Holy Spirit of God to minister to you now. I'm asking you to open yourself up before the presence of the Lord right now. And I don't want you to think about me. I'm ir- I'm really irrelevant. I'm just a messenger of this passing moment. The true messenger is Jesus Christ. Come before his presence now. Because what I sense in the Spirit is the presence of the Lord is being poured out upon you and in your midst. Some of you are in Bible studies. Some of you are gathered together with Christian friends or Christian family. Some of you are pastors or are in Christian leadership or ministry leadership of some kind, and you're all over the U.S. and all over the world. And as you're gathered, the Word of God says, when you're gathered, where two or more of you are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, there he is. In the so two or more of us are gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, and there he is in the midst of us. So I'm asking you to put your focus and your worship on the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is worthy. In the, in the book of Revelation, when you read when you read those incredible words of what's happening the throne, around the throne room of God in the book of Revelation, you hear the angels and the martyred saints singing to the Lord, he is worthy, he is worthy. Worthy, O Lord. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lord. And it's repeated over and over again. And it's a holy moment. So right now, wherever we are on earth, we're in this temporal world. We're sojourners, which means we're just passing through. No matter how many antioxidants we take take, or how many uh, exercise programs we join, we, we are sojourners. We're just passing through this earth. This earth is not our final destination. 
this earth is not our final home. Thank God. Because this earth is getting evil and twisted and nasty. Haven't you noticed? Okay, so when I read the book of Revelation and my heart breaks, think about this. 87% of evangelical churches and pastors and seminaries and Bible studies and Christians, 87% of evangelical Christians forbid the teaching and do not teach on the book of Revelation. That Talk about a hideous sin and an abomination that blocks the power of God, that locks up and blocks an authentic biblical third great awakening. You say, well, how can you say that? Because I, I get, I'm not making this stuff out of my head. I'm reading the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God says, specifically regarding the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible where at the beginning of the book and the end of the book of Revelation, there is a specific promise that if you faithfully teach and preach and interpret The book of Revelation, okay, it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, blessed is he who speaks, excuse me, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, the prophecy of the book of Revelation, and keeps those things which are written in it, for the time is near. This tells you and I, you want a blessing today? You can get an automatic blessing no matter how you feel by simply reading the book of Revelation. When you read the book of Revelation, God promises to pour out a blessing upon you, your Bible study, your church, your family, or whatever. And it says right here, Blessed is he or she who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. That means the entire book of Revelation and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us in his prophetic word in Revelation that the time is near. That means means the time is near. It's a lot nearer than you think it is and I think it is. Behold, he's knocking at the door, and he's saying, Hello, let me in. All right? So what else does it say? says in verse 7, Behold, he is coming, that soon, with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced uh, him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. Now, why would all the tribes, that means all the ethnic groups, all the uh, regional groups, all the the nationalities, the the diversity of populations, the tribes of the earth are going to be upset. They're going to cry. They're going to mourn when they see him. Why? 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 Because they know in their hearts that they're in rebellion from the Lord Jesus, and they know in their hearts that they're doing evil before the Lord Jesus, and they know in their hearts that when Jesus comes, he's already warned them. They know in their hearts they're going to receive the judgment of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, of course, they're mourning, they're crying and weeping because Jesus is coming. They've been serving Satan, the Prince of Darkness. And Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. There's only one Almighty, that's Jesus Christ. It's not a politician. It's not a scientist. It's not a country music star. It's not one of the bachelors or bachelorettes. There's only <laughs> there's only one who is to come, the Almighty, that's Jesus Christ. So we read that there's a blessing that comes upon anyone who reads the book of Revelation, a supernatural blessing. Okay? So... So right here, 87% of evangelical churches, evangelical Christians, pastors, Bible study leaders, Christian authors, Christian ministries, 87% of them have chosen to, to refuse the supernatural blessing of God 
that is guaranteed to come upon them if they would simply read and teach the book of Revelation faithfully. But 87% are saying, no, we don't want it. If you don't think that isn't a hindrance to an authentic, biblical, third great awakening, I don't know what is. Okay, now, then at the end of the book of Revelation, at the end of the book of Revelation, there's another promise of blessing and warning. There's no other book in the Bible where at the beginning of the book and the end of the book, there's a promise of a blessing or a curse. So in Revelation, uh, in Revelation, this is so powerful. I love the Bible. Turns me on. I am not. I never get bored with the Bible. If you tell me you're reading the Bible and you're bored, then you you don't know how to read the Bible. And and you need to come to Paradise Mountain Church when we restart our meetings after this pandemic. And and please allow me the privilege of teaching you the Bible in such a way that when you read it, you'll be as turned on as I am. Look, Paul McGuire hates two things. Paul McGuire hates pain, and Paul McGuire hates boredom. I don't like pain. So if I have a migraine headache or whatever, or a headache or whatever, I take either aspirin or ibuprofen or Tylenol. Why? Why? I hate pain. Then, number two, I hate to be bored. And I, I, if something's stupid and mundane, I get bored easily. I, I'm telling you, I'm not lying to you. I don't have to fake it. I'm not some religious freak, some legalistic Frankenstein. I am not bored reading the Bible. I am turned on. I am amped. I am flying. Talk about California Adventure, where they soar. It's an artificial ride where you soar over the state of California. Every time I read the Bible, I'm having a, a heaven adventure where I literally soar. I read the, Bible. the revelations that just explode. You know what happens to me when I, I'm not exaggerating. You know what happens to me when I read the Bible? It was like yesterday. We were looking down at different fireworks, and you know they're they're popping or exploding with all their light and stuff. When I look down at the Bible, there's paragraphs, portions, and words that seem to explode like like fireworks before my, my eyes, and I get a revelation of the meaning, and it's like fireworks going off. It's a turn-on. Okay, so this is what God is saying. Um, and, and I want you to, to share this with me. So, it says... Uh, in Revelation 22, verse 6, Then he said to me, that's Jesus, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the, of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Once again, over and over again in the Bible, Jesus repeatedly, when he's referring to his second coming, he repeatedly refers to his second coming, in terms of like it's going to shortly take place. It's coming near soon. It's happening soon. There's an urgency from Jesus. There's an immediacy in Jesus. This thing is not going to be drawn out in a long, boring process. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Now, when Jesus Christ tells you he's coming soon, guess what? He means it. That means you and I have to be ready. Are you ready? I'm serious. Are you ready? If Jesus was to come today, are you ready? One of my first prophecy books that my wife named was called Are You Ready? It was a best-selling prophecy book. The title had a lot to do with it. I didn't come up with the title. My wife did. But the title said it all, along with the cover photograph. We still have some of those available. You can order it at multiplier.us. And the question that I'm going to ask you is, if Jesus was going to come today, are you ready? If you're not, you need to get ready. You need to get ready. You need to get right with God. Otherwise, it's going to be awkward, painful, and embarrassing. Okay. Um, so, he says, "These, uh, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he 
who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So Jesus is coming quickly, and then it says, Blessed is he or she who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. What book? The prophecy of the book of Revelation. So God, at the end of the book of Revelation, is promising to pour out a supernatural blessing upon you if you keep the words and read the words of the prophecy of the book of Revelation. A a promise of blessing at the beginning of Revelation, a promise of blessing at the end of Revelation, a prophecy of a curse at the beginning of Revelation, a prophecy of a curse at the end of Revelation. Then an angel showed them all the different things. Um, Verse 10, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Do you know what that means? Let me be be very blunt, direct, and in a lot of people's faces. 87% of evangelical churches in America refuse to teach the book of Revelation. They are in total rebellion from God. That's fact. Now, Jesus says, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So Jesus is saying to every Christian, every Christian leader, every church, every minister, every seminary, every Bible study, he's saying to them, I'm coming quickly, wake up. And then he's saying, don't seal the words of this book. In other words, don't block the words of this book. Don't prevent the words of this book. Don't censor the words of this book from reaching my people. Because if you do, there will be severe severe judgment upon you. This is serious stuff. Do not seal up or censor the words of the prophecy of the book of Revelation. Why? Because the time is at hand. Then it says in verse 18, these are the words of Jesus Christ, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plague that are written in the book. So here God, Jesus, is warning people that uh, you're to hear the words of prophecy of the book of Revelation as they're written. And if anyone, a teacher, a pastor, a leader, or whatever, adds on uh, stuff that is not... In other words, if you add to the prophecies by distorting them, by making up a bunch of stuff, that's such a severe sin before God. If you add to the the book of Revelation, you add your own words and ideas that that are not in the Bible, it says God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and the things which are written in the book. Now that's pretty serious. If, because you have added to or distorted or prevented people from hearing the words of the prophecy of the book of Revelation, if anyone takes away or censors from the words of the book of prophecy of the book of Revelation, it says God will take away his part of the book of life. The Bible teaches us that if your name is not written in the book of life, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So if you block Revelation, distort Revelation, don't teach Revelation, as 87% of evangelical Christians do, and I'm not going to answer this for you, I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says God will take away your part from the book of life, which means that if your name is not written in the book of life, You cannot enter into heaven, because in order to enter into heaven, your name has to be written in the Book of Life. Um, From the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, these are the final words of Jesus Christ in Revelation, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely 
I am coming quickly. Once again, the emphasis is, emphasis is that Jesus is telling us he's coming quickly, not slowly. Notice that he's not saying over and over again in the book of Revelation, Behold, I am coming slowly. Behold, I am coming slowly. No, he's saying, Behold, I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So our mandate is clear. Jesus Christ, this is what built the Jesus movement. I was saved because of the Jesus movement. I was in rebellion at the University of Missouri, majoring in altered states of consciousness and filmmaking, radical politics. Jesus movement, I'm telling that whole story in my book, which you can pre-order now at a discount. Power, uh, power from on high. Jesus movement came to town, and, and they were on fire for God. And they set a whole bunch of us like me on fire. Not only did the Jesus movement move from California to Missouri to set me on fire for God, but they set me on fire for God. I brought it with me to New York City. God raised me up. Uh, to reach thousands of people for Jesus Christ, hosting and producing and promoting contemporary Christian music con- uh, concerts at a Broadway theater in Times Square called the Lambs Club. So I would fly in or have people like uh, Keith Green, Love Song, Barry McGuire, of so many, at that time, these were the biggest names in contemporary Christian music. No, Paul Stook. Thousands of people came to the Lord, and God raised me up and others up, and we became the leaders, and I became one of the leaders of the Jesus movement on the East Coast in New York City. A lot of people think, well, the Jesus movement was just on the West Coast. Well, that's where it started, and it moved across the country. But then the Jesus movement uh, came alive. Uh, on the East Coast and in New York City, and our ministry was an instrument, instrumental part of that because we flew in uh, many of these uh, contemporary Christian music groups that that were the Jesus movement, that had come from California, and they ministered to us and sang to us like Love Song, you know, Barry McGuire, uh, Keith Green, and so many others. They set us on fire, and we set other people on fire. That's how it works. When you're set on fire, you set other people on fire. It's my prayer to you today, wherever you're listening to planet Earth. It's my prayer to you today that the Bomb Wire Report and our ministry and the books and the radio program, video, check out our YouTube channel. Got a YouTube channel that's back on, check out our Roku channel, all the other backup channels, and allow the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word of God to set you on fire. Set you on fire. And as we spread this fire and the truth of God's Word spreads across the world, revival, an authentic biblical revival spreads across the world and brings in a massive harvest of souls. That's our goal here. And we can accomplish that goal. Every day, this message goes all across the world, touching people like you. In fact, right now, I just want to stop and say something. As your brother in Christ, and I consider myself a servant in Christ, that's why I very rarely Will you see me use titles that I'm entitled to use in front of my name? Uh, for example, I'm entitled to use in front of my name Professor Paul McGuire. I was an adjunct professor for like 20 or 30 years at Jack Hayford's King's College and Seminary, and I was a professor of eschatology or Bible prophecy. So I'm entitled to use the word doctor. McGuire or Professor McGuire. Very rarely, if ever, do you see me use that title. There's nothing wrong with it. 
uh, I just choose not to use it. And then very rarely, even though I am a licensed minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and senior pastor of Paradise Mountain Church, very rarely will you see me call myself Pastor McGuire or, or a senior pastor of Paradise Mountain Church, Paul McGuire. The reason I refrain from the titles is because, and, I'm, and look, if other people want to use the titles, that's fine. I'm not judging anybody else. It's just for me, uh, and what God has called me to do, those titles would get in the way of me being able to relate to a lot of people that I, uh, that I want to win Jesus. So what I'm saying is, I have, um, I have the, the right to refer myself to refer myself as Dr. Paul McGuire, Professor Paul McGuire, or Paul McGuire, the senior pastor of Paradise Mountain Church. I decline to use those titles because I want to be on equal playing field with the people that I minister to. And I really want to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now, I'm saying that, but I want to say right now, I believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is moving through this program by God's grace because I want to thank you, so many of you, who are listening all over the world and the United States, I know this is true. You have chosen to be intercessory prayer warriors for me, my family, and this ministry. And because of your intercessory prayers and your prayer warfare, there is an anointing in the studio every time I do the program. There is an anointing on me uh, because of your prayers. And that anointing carries revival in it. You know, I was seeking the Lord and crying out to God and contending for revival by faith, and the Lord showed me something. He said, Paul, stop asking me for revival. Stop contending for revival. The Lord said, I have given you the revival you've asked for from the moment you started to seriously pray for it and ask me for it. And the Lord, then the Lord said to me, Paul, I am going to use you and your ministry and your partners who are praying for you, spreading the word uh, of your message and your partners who are contributing financially and with their donations. I'm, I'm going to use you and your partners to ignite. And he used the word ignite, and I kept seeing the word ignition in my spirit. I'm going to use you and your partners to ignite an authentic biblical revival, an authentic biblical third great awakening that will sweep America and the world. And the Lord didn't just say, it's not just you, Paul, that I'm going to do this through. The Lord said to me, I am raising up a spiritual army of men and women who are sold out to me. Uh, uh, people who are lay people, people who are pastors, they're all over the United States, they're all over the world, a remnant church, if you will, and they're all crying out together. They're all seeking me, the Lord Jesus Christ, together. And the Lord said, I am going to use all of you, all of you. That means you listening. It's not about me, okay? I really want to make that clear. This is not about me. It's more importantly about you. The Lord is going to use you and me and everyone listening to ignite an authentic biblical revival and ignite an authentic biblical third great awakening that will sweep the world, but the teaching that the Lord has given me uh, to, to, in a sense, enable the Great Awakening and the revival to stay on track and not go off course, is the Lord has had me do tremendous Bible study on this topic and to emphasize 
something that is lacking from the evangelical church, which is the revival is first an outpouring of the Holy Spirit by grace and contrition and repentance that is biblical, authentic, and biblical. The Holy Spirit, power from on high, will fall upon my people. Acts chapter 2, first and foremost. But then the Lord said, unless that biblical, authentic biblical revival and a great awakening is an accompanied by a second all-important truth, which is it must flow from a biblical worldview, from the Word of God, and from rightly dividing the Word of God, and learning uh, the truth of the Bible to such an extent that you can interact, deal, and exercise the Word of God in every area of life, just like the pilgrims and Puritans could. Philosophy, science, physics, medicine, uh, astronomy, theology, history, and so on and so forth. A, a, a person must have a biblical worldview, or you're not equipped to handle the power that God wants to send through you. So that's where we are. So let me share this to you from my heart now. I'm very serious. I've been seeking the Lord very intensively. I've been writing this book very intensively. And the Lord has said to me repeatedly, tell my people that it is my desire to send them an authentic and biblical third great awakening that will consist of two primary parts. The Holy Spirit being poured out, not a counterfeit spirit, not the great apostasy, not Kundalini, not some occult spirit, but the Holy Spirit being poured out. And then the Lord said, and this authentic and biblical third great awakening will uh, be carried to its target by being true to the Word of God, adhering to the authority of God's Word, making sure God's Word alone is your final authority, and incorporating a biblical worldview which is what the pilgrims and Puritans did. Now, what the Lord told me to tell God's people, he said, tell my people that if they will tend by faith for this revival, if they will repent in true repentance, if they won't give up, but they'll continue to come boldly before my throne. You know, the word of God says, come boldly to the a throne of grace by a new and living way. That simply means we don't come to God based on uh, our legalistic good works we did and assume because we earned brownie points with God that God's going to send revival or bless us. That is not how we come before God. We come before God through a new and living way, which means we come to God, Jesus Christ, into his throne room by appropriating the blood of Jesus Christ, grace, unmerited favor. And we ask God to cleanse us of all sin. And we ask God that the blood of Jesus Christ would cleanse us of all sin. So we come boldly to the throne of grace, cleansed of all sin through the blood of Jesus. And there, from that position, we ask God to send revival and answer prayers to the other things. That's the first thing that we do. Now, the key is, and this is where modern evangelicals mess up. You know, we had a, a giant national intercessory prayer uh, meeting, repentance, and that was great. But evangelicals like try stuff and then pick up their toys and go home. And what God was telling me in my heart is tell my people that they are to come back over and over again. Uh, coming boldly to the throne of grace, asking me to send them a biblical third great awakening. And that means they are to keep coming to me, and, and they must completely repent, and they must contend in faith for this biblical revival. They can't just give up. God was telling me, I am tired of my people being religious rather than being truly spiritual. I am tired of my people playing church uh, versus 
being authentically spiritual, God said to me, he said, I am willing to send my people in America, Britain, Zealand, Australia, Asia, South America, Greece, uh, Ukraine, Russia, and God named all kinds of Australia, New Zealand. God said, I am poised. I am ready. I am eager to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a mighty revival on a level the world has never seen before. A mighty revival that will drive back the powers of darkness. A mighty revival that will break the grip that the demons and fallen angels have had over nations and people and continents. The Lord said, I am ready to pulverize and break the grip of the fallen angels over these territories. And then the Lord said to me, tell my people that they need to be aggressive and they need to get in my face and repent and that they are to continue on, continue on and wage war in the spirit and never give up. In other words, God was saying, my people play. And after a few minutes, they get tired and they go home. They pick up their toys and they go home. God said, that's not going to open the windows of heaven. God said, if my people will will uh, commit themselves in an unwavering stance of faith, they can call down the energies and powers of heaven. You know, there's a verse, and the Lord just put this in my heart, regarding the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. What that means is that God's kingdom, along with what is in God's kingdom, salvation, healing, a biblical revival, and so on and so forth, the way we as believers enter the kingdom of heaven and release and open the doors of the kingdom of heaven so that an authentic biblical revival can be poured out here on earth in a massive last day soul harvest is when we adhere to the scripture. For the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. That means the, the kingdom of heaven needs to be violently approached by God's people. Now, the word violent doesn't mean some sadistically cruel, angry, antichrist spirit violence. It means a spiritual violence. Let me define that for you. When the only thing standing between us and a billion people coming into the kingdom of heaven as the result of a last day soul harvest, when God desires to break up the entire international sex trafficking networks, when God desires to bring down the wicked and the evil all over the earth, okay? It is appropriate, says the Lord, that my people come into my throne room with, with a spirit-led aggression and a spirit-led violence that is appropriate to the level of evil that is attacking them and attacking the earth. So it is perfectly appropriate and perfectly scriptural for my people to operate this way, for the kingdom of of heaven suffereth violence. That means the saints of God, that's you and me, are going to enter into the throne room of God with such fierceness and tenacity and, yes, violence, that we are going to shake the strongholds of hell, break the strongholds of hell, and release uh, a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Christianity is not about being religious or playing church. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Our, Our prayers, our intercessions, violently move into the spiritual realm and destroy the works of Satan. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violent, and the violence take it by force. And so, in a Holy Spirit-anointed violence, we take what the devil has stolen, we take it back by force. You understand? 
That's the level of Holy Spirit aggression that God that pleases the Lord. Let me illustrate it more simply. When King David walked by all the cowards in the army of Israel who were terrified of going against uh, Goliath the giant who was taunting the armies of Israel, David walked up anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit and got a slingshot with one stone. And David's actions exemplified the biblical principle that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. David was fearless, anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. When he faced down the giant Goliath, Goliath was taunting the armies of Israel. Then a quickening. Which, which came about through an explosion of dunamis, the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. When the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit discharges and releases in dunamis, the dynamite explosion of the Holy Spirit, that can be defined as a form of spiritual violence. When the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit explodes violently, that's dunamis, that's dynamite, that's appropriate. So so the dunamis, the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit, which is violence, explodes in David's heart and mind, and he thunders into Goliath, how dare you defy the armies of the living God? And then he, as the dunamis explodes inside of him, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. David walked up to Goliath, or before he walked up to Goliath, He slew him with one slingshot, and then he chopped off Goliath's head and held it up to the Philistines, who ran in terror and retreated. Now, that's a messy story. Evangelicals are uncomfortable with that, but that's a perfect illustration of the appropriate nature of implementing the biblical principle of The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. God is waiting for his people and saints in America and around the world not to be lawless, not to be angry, not to be physically violent. He's waiting for his people to worship him and, and open themselves up to him on a deep level where they're clothed with power from on high. When, when power from on high, which is the Holy Spirit, fills them, then there's an ignition and there's the explosion of the dunamis power of God, the dynamite power of God, which releases a velocity of a Holy Spirit explosion, which destroys the works of darkness and the devil. That's what God wants us to do in this hour. He wants us to bring down the strongholds. Uh, and set people free from the territories of captivity of Satan. Are you with me? So now is our finest hour. How do we do that? Well, first of all, the Lord is ministering to you right now through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you want to, I'm not talking about tongues versus no tongues. I'm not here to pre- uh, uh, promote Pentecostalism or non-Pentecostalism. I'm just not interested in fighting over those things. I, I spent too many years listening to people fight over it. I'm coming to you now and saying God is calling. God is calling you, whether you're male or female, to be like David. God is calling you to, to understand that he wants to give you a revelation of your new identity, that you're more than a conqueror in Christ and that the Lord wants to use you now, and the Lord is asking you right now, yeah, at this moment, the Lord is asking you right now to open your inner man, inner woman up, and worship the Lord by praising his name. Praise you, Jesus. Worship you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus, that you're King of kings and Lord of lords. And as you're praising the Lord and acknowledging that he's King of kings and Lord of lords, you say these words to the Lord. So go ahead and say them. Don't say them. You have not because you ask not. 
Lord Jesus Christ, you who are King of kings and Lord of lords, I ask that you would fill me to overflowing with the power of your Holy Spirit right now. I ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would clothe me supernaturally with power from on high. I ask Jesus that the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit would have its dynamite explosion in igniting an authentic biblical revival where the pure biblical Holy Spirit is released in the form of power from on high. Lord, I ask you to clothe me right now with power from on high, that the Holy Spirit would dwell in me with all its power and fullness, God. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I open myself up to be ministered to by, to be filled by power from on high, God. I ask that this power from on high would transform my life. I ask that all bondages would be broken now, Jesus. All addictions would be shattered. Any mental battle of despair, depression, defeat, unhappiness, insecurity, self-doubt, that all of that would be vaporized by the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I praise your name, Jesus. I praise you in, to anoint me for battle, God, for spiritual battle. I put on the full armor of God uh, outlined in the book of Ephesians. I put on the full armor of God. Praise your name. I want to read you something here in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, God says that this is going to happen in the last days. It says it in the book of Acts, chapter 2, and Joel, chapter 2, okay? And this is what preceded the Jesus movement and many movements of God. And I believe that you will hear this verse uh, being taught and spoken of in increasing frequency because God is about to turn the tide of the spiritual battle. Many of God's people have been uh, terrified of the giants in the land, and God wants to renew their vision and their perception so that they see the giants like grasshoppers and the giants see them like giants. A change in perception. And then God wants his people to invade the promised land, the land of Canaan, and take over uh, the territories that the giants have stolen in the last days. And that means now. Okay, so I'm going to read something to you in Acts chapter 2. I'm excited. I, You know, the, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And right now I'm filled with the joy of the Lord. It's supernatural. Okay, so Peter, the Holy Spirit is being poured out on the day of Pentecost, okay? And the Holy Spirit is coming down on the apostles. And it's a tremendous time. In Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So God wants to fill you with power from on high right now. All you have to do is with childlike faith be open to it, and with childlike faith receive it. Then in Acts chapter 2, Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord, true biblical unity, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them as divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So now they're so filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, they're really in a state of ecstasy. And the peoples from all the nations are checking out the the disciples, and they (laughs) they think that the disciples are drunk. And Peter has to correct them. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, 
Let this be known to you, and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great, awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. So here it is. Here it is. The Lord is moving unusually. And if you'll walk with the Lord and receive what the Lord has, he will pour out his spirit upon you and your family and everything you're related to. Not only that, no matter what condition they're in, forget about their temporal condition. They may be temporarily backslid. Big deal. God God can change that. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Claim that. Your young men shall see vision. Young men who may be in rebellion from God, they're going to get knocked off their high horses, fall on their butts, and they're going to see visions from God and be transformed, just like it happened in the Jesus book. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Those days are now. God is about to pour out his spirit across the earth in an unprecedented manner. Acts chapter 2. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. We've seen a lot of signs and wonders in the heavens, the blood moons, the sun uh, going black. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And this is the most important part. And it shall come to pass on the name of the Lord. That, that it shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. So all of this is being done to bring millions into the kingdom of God. I'm asking you to pray for me, with me, family, this ministry. I need you to be, and I thank you for your diligent intercessory prayer warfare. Thank you. Thank you for spreading our messages far and wide. Thank you. Thank you for seeking the Lord and being obedient to the Lord, and whatever the Lord has told you to do in terms of giving and donations, thank you ahead of time for being obedient, giving uh, whatever the the Lord has uh, told you to give. Together, we will ignite this biblical revival. These are the last days, okay? So carry on, and do it with joy. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us.